Good evening and welcome to the AAUW branch monthly meeting this evening and welcome to our program. This program this evening is featuring Dr. Sheila Caldwell, Chief Diversity Officer for the SIU System and Paul, Dr. Paul Frazier, Vice Chancellor for Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion at SIUC. According to Dr. Caldwell, in spring of 2022, the Southern Illinois University System Office collaborated with the Viewfinder Campus Climate Survey to administer an anonymous and confidential survey to faculty, staff, and students and administrators. The aim of this survey was to assess perceptions about sense of belonging, political and religious views, safety bias incidents, and access to resources. These findings will be used to make evidence-based decisions to improve recruitment and retention of SIU students and employees. And the findings of this survey Looks like we lost you there, Sarah, sorry. Uh, it says I'm unmuted. You are good to go now. Ah, I hope I'm sorry for some reason. I'm, I was muting myself and uh, I'd like to continue here. Uh, the findings of this survey are highlighted with regard to the SIU system climate data, uh, as well as specifically the Carbondale campus. Uh, Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Frazier will answer questions at the end of this presentation. If you are watching and have access to the Q&A on your programming, uh, you may send a question into the program. If they are duplicate program, duplicate questions, chances are they will sound similar to each other and we will save them for one at a time. But to use your Q&A. And thank you, Dr. Caldwell, we will be happy to hear from you this evening. I would like to, first of all, thank Ms. Martin and Ms. Um, Mrs. Richard for uh, having us uh, here today, me, along with my uh, colleague, Dr. Paul Frazier. Um, as Ms. Martin said, uh, we're very excited to be with you uh, on this election day, uh, sharing um, meaningful findings um, from our campus climate survey. And so I'm going to share my screen um, just, again, as you can follow along with me and uh, be able to see some of the findings and data from um, the, the page. And if I could just give me one moment. Okay. So as Ms. Martin said, um, we did embark on doing a system-wide campus climate survey for SIU. And I do want to share um, that I think you being located in Carbondale, I would actually almost encourage you to really pay careful attention to Dr. Frazier. Uh, and um, to get an overview, I'm going to share data across the system. And that includes the Carbondale campus, Edwardsville, East St. Louis, the School of Medicine. So with this survey, we sent it out to 20,000 students and 7,000 employees. And what we wanted to basically analyze or, or get from this particular survey is that we embarked by using Viewfinder Campus Climate Survey because one of the concerns um, when people participate in these activities is, will it be confidential? Will it be anonymous? And so the answer to that question, to those questions were yes. And we hired a third party vendor, Viewpinder, to actually conduct this survey. And we um, looked specifically at faculty, staff, students, and administrators. And we wanted to assess their perceptions about sense of welcome, sense of belonging, their political and religious views, did they feel safe on campus, and also their access um, to resources, not only in the workplace, but also in the classroom environment, outside the classroom, as they did co-curricular activities and in the surrounding community. And we specifically targeted 
diverse constituents as we looked at this particular survey. So we wanted to know how do international faculty, staff, and students feel? How do you feel on the campus if you are white, if you are African-American, if you're Asian, if you're Latinx, if you are um, you know, Native American? So we specifically looked at those particular groups. We also wanted to know about people with disabilities, um, again, where they have access to resources that were suitable um, and least restricted for them. The LGBTQIA community, as well as veterans. So as I share my data, I'm gonna specifically talk about their experiences as well. And as we talk about experiences, it's important to note that not only did we have quantitative you know, numbers um, specifically that outline and highlight this survey, we received over a thousand comments and um, Dr. Dan Mahoney, who serves as our SIU president, along with myself, we read over a thousand comments and we reviewed more than 30 reports. And then we analyzed um, the data along with Dr. Frazier on the Carbondale campus, along with Dr. Jessica Harris on the Edwardsville campus, along with Dr. Wendy Elamine, who serves as the Associate um, Dean of ADEI for our School of Medicine. And so I mentioned that to say is that we do have a lot of robust data um, that we were able uh, and findings that we were able to glean from this particular survey. And so now I want to just actually share um, the demographics. Uh, we had a 52% 52 52 response rate from all of our employees. And again, when we specifically consulted with Viewfinder, they said you do not want to get less than 50% if you want this data to be credible and reliable. So we were pleased to get 50%, 52% from all of our employees across the system again, including faculty, staff, and administrators. And then we got about 18% of respondents were students. And the goal was about 20%. So we were pleased with that. Again, having a process that was reliable. As far as gender, 52% were female, about 46% identified as male, and 2% identified as non-conforming with respect to gender. Now, if we move on to race, what were the ethnic demographics? You see that green bar, 77% white uh, respondents, 10% Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander, 7% African American, and 3% Hispanic, Latino, Latinx responded to the survey. One of the findings that I thought was very interesting, um, when we look nationally at data, I think we're at about maybe 12% uh, respond to identifying as LGBTQIA. On our campuses, again, across the system, 22% of our students identified as LGBTQIA+. When we asked the same question about faculty and their gender identity, it was actually 7% for faculty and staff. It actually came in even. Uh, specifically, when we looked at veterans, about 4% for faculty, staff, and students identified as veterans. Uh, when we think about our disabled population, it was about 7% who identified um, as a person with a disability. And they specifically, more than 50% of those disabilities went in the categories of psychological and medical conditions. I think another thing that's worth noting is we ask questions like, why did you choose SIU? Like, why was this a place of location uh, for you when it came to employment and also for school choice when, when we look at our students? And so location was actually over 50% for faculty, staff, and administrators. So the top reason why individuals were choosing SIU was because of location. And then when we asked employees, okay, that was your first choice, what is your second choice? They specifically talked about work-life balance. And then when we asked our students, they specifically looked at degree choice. Are you offering my program of study? And that was the primary reason our students are choosing SIU. And then again, I talked about welcome. We want to know, are people happy? Are they pleased? Do they wanna get up? and come to SIU. And again, we did this survey because we wanna make sure that faculty, staff, students, and administrators are pleased with their experiences and they want to come to work every day and they want to retain employment and continue to get their education here. So these findings are also interesting. Specifically, if you just look at the bars, I'm gonna talk about sense of welcome. So African-American is the first category, then we have Asian followed by Hispanic followed by white. And so the blue bar represents sense of welcome. 65% of African-Americans feel welcome compared to 64% of the Asian community. And then look at this very significant dip for the Hispanic population, Hispanic Latino, 31%. So that's less than 50% 
of Asian and African American, that number is 50% lower than those groups. And if you look at white, they come in at the highest at 80% for a sense of welcome. And then we actually also asked about how do you feel about anti-racism? And that's in the orange bar. Like, do you feel like SIU is living up to its standard of declaring itself an anti-racist institution? Only 30% of African-Americans agreed with that, that SIU is living up to that proclamation compared to 64% of Asian, again, lower at 51% Hispanic, but higher than African-American and then 63% white. So, and then the gray bar um, is actually looking at students. So when we look at um, African-American, 53% of our students, we actually look at them too, feel a sense of welcome compared to 64% of Asian students, 70% um, for Hispanic, and then the highest bar for white was 78%. So again, we get to see um, sense of welcome and, and just the differences, but I am paying attention to the fact that we really have a lot of work to do. Again, when we look at our Hispanic uh, faculty, um, and even um, our, our staff members because they feel the least welcome on our campus. And so actually this is a summary of the data and I do wanna share quickly about this. Um, it is important to know that over 50% of when we look at the cumulative number of all faculty, staff, students and administrators felt welcome on our campuses. Administrators and white employees felt the most welcome among all groups. White and Asian staff members felt more welcome than Hispanic and Latino members. So we do wanna compare and say, what type of experiences are different groups having? And so that's why you see those correlations and comparisons. Staff members of color reported lower levels of respect and unequal treatment to their white counterparts. In addition to asking, do you have a sense of belonging? We also ask, do you feel equal? Do you feel like you're treated equal? And members of color, Hispanic, Asian, and Hispanic said, even though they felt welcome, that they did not feel equal. They did not feel the equal treatment um, as their uh, white colleagues on the campus. White and African-Americans perceive themselves to be less welcome than other ethnic groups. And I actually wanna talk about this for a moment. When I mentioned those 40 reports, it was very important for us to disaggregate and compare. So if you can imagine this, and I'm actually gonna just take a moment to explain it. One of the things we wanted to do, and instead of asking broadly sense of welcome, we specifically looked at the white group, the Asian group, the Hispanic group, the African-American group. And we said, okay, not only do, you, do we want you to judge your sense of welcome, we want you to judge others' sense of welcome. So if Asians, if white uh, community members said, you know, we feel like we're welcome 80% of the time, believe it or not, they said every other group was above that 80%. So even though they rated themselves high, they rated themselves lower than every other ethnic group. So from their perception, when we think about welcome and sense of belonging, our white community members are saying in this survey, that they feel less welcome than other ethnic groups on campus. And the only other group that identified the exact same way was African-Americans. If they were at 60%, they said the Hispanics are at 65%, the Asians are at 80%, the whites are at 85%. So even though they rated themselves a certain number, they rated every other group higher than theirs. And I want to make that point to say that when we think about welcome and sense of belonging, white and African-Americans feel like all other groups are being more welcome and more embraced on campus. And I thought that was an interesting finding, which is why I wanted to take a few moments to explain that. And then again, when we talk about, I specifically talked about unequal treatment, again, Hispanic members were the lowest. Now this was on a, a, a 4.0 scale. Anything below a 3.0 is cause of concern. It is a, a meaningful finding when it's below that number. Hispanic, 2.7, African-American, 2.59, and Asian, uh, 2.93. And one of the things I'm trying to do is, is, because of how my screen is, it might be difficult for me to re read the last um, bar, but I think you all can read through that. So I just wanted to highlight some of these things with um, perceptions of welcome. I also mentioned religious and political expression. So one of the things I, I want to highlight across the board, again, that was a unique finding, when we specifically asked about religious and political expression, we found across the board, white faculty, staff, and students felt like they could not openly express their political expression. So when we think about election season, that could mean, well, I don't want to tell you who I'm going to vote for because I don't want to feel isolated. I don't want to feel ostracized, and I don't want to feel cast out of whatever community I'm a part of. I didn't just make those things up. 
when we looked at the qualitative data, that's exactly what the white population said. They literally said, I fear, we saw this comment several times, I fear that if I share my political views, that I will not, I will be alienated from my community if they don't agree with me. And I also thought it was interesting that some of the words that were grouped together as a white Christian conservative, I felt like I cannot express my views on campus. And so again, when we look at the data, if you look at the orange box, most of our respondents identified as Christian, agnostic, and Catholic in that order, okay? It might be a little bit different on the Carbondale campus, and I think Dr. Frazier may um, speak about that more specifically, but less than 50% said they could express their religious views, and less than 40% felt like they can ex express their political views. Uh, one of the things I think that's worth noting is that we want to be responsive to this. On November 16th, we're having a conversation of understanding, and this is the third one um, this academic year. And this particular conversation is going to talk about freedom of thought, I mean, freedom of expression and diversity of thought. Because we want to teach our students to think well, but not what to think, and we want all of our students to be able to engage in a civil and respectful discourse. And so I found these numbers to be bothersome. Um, the last thing I'll say about this slide, and again, I welcome any questions up towards the end, is that some people, the, another reason why these numbers were low is because we also had several faculty and staff members who said, I don't feel comfortable expressing religious and political expression because that's not an appropriate environment. They didn't feel like the workplace was the best place to, uh, the best place to speak about their religious and political affiliation. So I think that's worth noting, and that's another reason why that number was lower. I have a few more uh, slides to share as I think about uh, my time, um, but bias and safety. We ask um, individuals, if there is an incident, if there is a problem, what is your course of action? So we found that the majority of our perceptions of bias and our incident reporting was focused on bullying and race gender discrimination. And I wanna actually talk about that again, when I go back to the 40, report, 40 reports that we looked at, one of those reports were comparison reports, and we looked at uh, California and, and the Panoma University. We looked at Augusta. We looked at um, schools in Georgia and Ohio, and we found that even though about 23% of our faculty and staff reported bullying, the national benchmark was at about 26%. So we were aligned with that data. We're not proud of that, but I wanted to make sure that we can temper that data with national feedback. So 23%. So bullying was top and also race and gender discrimination. Those are the main two things that we are dealing with as far as perceptions of bias and reporting incidents. Another thing that's worth noting is that most of the offenses were committed within peer group. If we can kind of think about crime, it's typically across the nation, uh, it's, it's a geographical thing. So, and what do I mean by that? If um, the offenses being committed within peer groups, faculty tend to offend other faculty members. Students tend to attend, uh, offend other students. Staff members, because they are in close proximity to each other, are more likely to file a biased incident report on another faculty because they work closely together, okay? So that's how those 72% of faculty, when you said who caused a biased incident report, if it was a faculty member, 72% said it was another faculty member. So again, I wanted to make sure we were clear about that. And then we asked if, you did, if, you, if an incident did occur and you did not, file a report, what hindered you from filing a report? And faculty and staff members overall said that they were afraid to report due to nothing being done. They did not think anything would be done or they fear retaliation. And so again, that's another conversation of understanding that we're gonna address because retaliation is illegal, it's against the law. And right now we are being trained on that across SIU campuses. We're going through uh, training um, that everyone has to participate in on an annual basis. And we want people to know that they can safely report bias because if you fear that nothing's gonna be done or you fear retaliation, then we all know that the problems can get worse. And again, the goal of actually conducting this survey is so that we can address these issues and have an improved campus climate. If we move on to safety, I think it's worth uh, actually celebrating that the majority of all, our, of, of all of our respondents feel safe on SIU campuses. And when we ask what is something that would make them feel safer than they already do, over 60% reported that they would feel safer if they were able to report something anonymously out of concern for a team member. So I think a team member may hurt themselves. I think a team member may hurt someone else. Maybe that person was the only person confided in, or maybe it was a few people. 
and they want to be able to report that anonymously. So that is something that we're working on to give people a space where we can, we don't want to accuse people because it's anonymous report, but if something um, may happen and we can mitigate that situation and make sure that that individual is not harmed or they do not harm others, we definitely want a way to have a reporting mechanism for that. And I think it's also worth noting when it talked about safety, and again, when we disaggregated the data, faculty and staff of color were more likely to report negative interactions with the police. In fact, most of their biases um, throughout the system were focused on negative interactions with the police. It's also worth noting that when we ask students of color why they would not report uh, a biased incident, it's because they felt like that they would be made hyper-visible and that the, the situation would be made worse because they, instead of them reporting a problem, they would become the problem. And then as a result of that, they can be ostracized in the community. So I do like to make those distinctions because again, people are having different experiences. A couple of more things I would like to share before we move on to Dr. Frazier. I mentioned a thousand comments that was in the survey. And again, we wanted to basically say, okay, what are some of the major things, major patterns that we're looking at based on comments, based on feedback? So we found that diversity fatigue was a, a concern. People basically saying we talk a lot about diversity, maybe they wanna see more action, um, let's talk about diversity. And we saw a lot of comments saying, I'm tired of uh, discussing diversity, but then we also had faculty and staff from the majority culture, the white culture, as well as uh, racialized ethnic, Hispanic, Asian, African-American, Native American, who said, I'm experiencing racial battle fatigue. We need to do more with diversity. So we saw diversity fatigue. We also saw uh, observe racial battle fatigue as well. Uh, there was a lot of concern about fairness in hiring and promotion. I mentioned conversations of understanding. Last month, we talked about the myth of the most qualified applicant. There was a lot of data um, basically espousing that if you are a member of the majority group, if you are white uh, male, and, uh, and I'm just being transparent, that you're unlikely to be able to get a job at SIU and that there were more people of color who were basically taking jobs. And I'm very pleased to say that, you know, as we looked at the data, it showed that we really need to focus more on gender hiring because that's what the issue is, that we need more women in leadership roles. But it also showed that when we look at our senior administrative cabinet members, when we look at our deans, when we look at our chairs, all of those different layers of leadership, the majority were white and the overwhelming majority were white males. And Dr. Mahoney shared that data and I would encourage any of you all who would want to listen to the myth of the most qualified applicant, as well as us discuss diversity fatigue. If you go on our SIU YouTube channel, those conversations are up there um, for you to review at any at your leisure. Okay, uh, lack of benevolence, bias, and racism—that was another theme. I talked about that in the data. So again, we want to address that not only with faculty and staff of color, but also with our white members, because again, we saw data to show that even though they felt a high sense of belongingness, that they feel like other groups um, maybe have more space for them at this moment. And we want to basically, I think it's really important as I talk about the data, is that we want to look at faction, not fiction, right? Perceptions is how people feel. So we definitely want to address how individuals feel, but we also have to look at the facts. So if we see in the facts that, okay, you might feel like it's not fairness to hiring and promotion, but 78% of the top leadership positions are occupied by white men and that's above the national average, that's a fact. The fact that you feel like you can't get a job as a white male at SIU, that's fiction because the data does not align with that. And so again, we want to acknowledge the perception and the feeling, but we also want to make sure that the numbers support those feelings or once people get the numbers, that they can temper their feelings with reality. A lack of appreciation for work. Again, I think that that's something that we could do and we should start doing that today. Um, our, our employees work very hard at the college. My thing is if you're on the payroll, we should express value and we should be able to affirm and encourage you. So that's low hanging fruit. And we definitely wanna make sure people feel affirmed, valued and seen on our campus. And that's another thing that we're doing is we're thinking about how to incentivize and how to encourage. And the last thing, uh, again, that was also very um, highlighted in our narrative findings was that inadequate, inadequate salary and benefits. So people spoke extensively and freely about these issues. I'm feeling diversity fatigue, lack of fairness, lack of belongingness, lack of appreciation for work, inadequate salary and benefits. So these are the things that we're gonna address on a monthly basis in our conversations of understanding. Uh, and the last thing I'm gonna share is, these are our recommendations, expanding training, educating our students on free speech, which we'll be doing, collaborating, 
um, to collect, organize, and examine data, and then also um, developing an equity plan to make sure that our students are treated fairly and that they come and that they can graduate. And that's important because another one last data point I'm gonna share before I turn it over is that again, when we disaggregated, we found that African-American students are twice as likely to want to leave the campus as white students, 12% versus 6%. So again, when we talk about equity, making sure our faculty staff of color, LGBTQIA, that they can be recruited and that they can be retained and they can be promoted and treated fairly. We want that for all of our employees. But as we see those distinctions, we have to pay careful attention to those areas that present themselves as an issue. So again, I want to thank you all for your time and attention, uh, listening to this information. And I look forward to uh, addressing questions um, after Dr. Frazier uh, speaks specifically about the Carbondale campus. Thank you for your time today. Some I'll just touch briefly on the we have for the campus. Spend a little more time talking about this. Oh, I just want to let you know your voice is not coming through as clear. I don't know if it's just me, but I just wanted to make you aware of that. Yeah, it says it's sounding bad for everyone. I just saw that from the tech. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Hmm. Uh, it? Better. Thank you. Much better. So, so um, it happened again. It's, it's still not clear. Sorry. Say say something else, and I could probably tell you. It's it's still shoddy. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's not as clear. It's like in and out. It fluctuates. Can I share before Dr. Frazier comes on? Will that help? Yes. Okay. What I, I'd like to tell you, first of all, I'd like to share with you about Dr. Sheila Caldwell, and then we'll see if we can get Dr. Frazier's uh, speaking to uh, correct itself. Dr. Sheila Caldwell currently serves as the Vice President of Anti-Racism, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer for the Southern Illinois University System in Springfield, Illinois. She works across the campuses in Springfield, Carbondale, Edwardsville, and East St. Louis. To strengthen equity and to ensure a level playing field for all students, staff, faculty members. During her tenure, she, she has collaborated with SIU team members to develop a system-wide land acknowledgement statement, anti-racism vision statement, an inclusive language guide, and conduct a system-wide campus climate survey, which you have seen in the, in the past few uh, moments here. Prior to joining Southern Illinois University in July of 2021, Dr. Caldwell served as the inaugural Chief Intercultural Engagement Officer for Wheaton College. She collaborated across, uh, across the college uh, to create the first Christ-centered diversity commitment statement Flourishing for All Diversity Strategic Plan and Gender Equity Vision Statement. During her tenure, as all, she also implemented, expanded, and sustained faculty mentoring programs, inclusive hiring training, and employee strategic advisory councils for Asian Americans, Latinx faculty, and staff members. 
Most recently, she has received notable awards for championing, championing it gets one of those nights, folks, championing diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. The SIU system is the only system in the country to receive the 2022 Higher Education Excellence in Diversity Award. She has been honored by the Quads County Urban League as a 2020 Woman of Power honoree and by she, S-H-E, Chicago for Strong, Humble, and Empowering Leadership. Caldwell earned a doctorate in education from the University of Georgia. She, complete, she completed Harvard Kennedy School Strategies for Building Leading Diverse Organizations Executive Education Program. And we have heard multi work in many, many hours. I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Paul Frazier. Hopefully his uh, speaker is uh, getting straightened out as we work on this. Dr. Paul, Paul Frazier has received a doctorate in educational leadership, a master's in educational mid-management, a master's in curriculum and instruction, and a bachelor of science degree from Texas Tech University. He currently serves as the vice chancellor for anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion at Southern Illinois University. Served as the inaugural chief diversity officer at the University of South Alabama, and the Associate Vice President of the Division of Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Community Engagement at Texas Tech University. He has taught as an adjunct instructor at Texas Tech University and as a faculty member at Southern Illinois University, teaching both undergraduate and graduate level education courses. He served in public education for 24 years as the executive director of student administrative services, a high school principal, a middle school assistant principal, and alternate alternative school assistant principal. He has also taught history and English on the high school and middle levels, in addition to coaching several high school sports. Dr. Frazier has served on various civic community and civic and community boards. He currently serves on the St. Louis Region Girl Scout Board. He has served as the Region 1 disproportionately Texas statewide representative for child protective services and is part of the Texas Association of School Administrators and Texas Alliance of Black School Educators. He is a board member of the Texas Diversity Council. So I do hope that uh, we have the uh, speaker working and I am going to introduce Dr. Paul Frazier at this time. I hope. Now. Speak now. a little bit more, but it sounds a bit better. Okay. Now, that does sound better. Thanks so much, Dr. Frazier. Uh, well, I say that you might not be able to see my PowerPoint now, so let's let's see. <laughs> Knocking on wood. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let me see what we got here. Uh, let me share my screen. You guys can't see it. We can't. Um, you should have the ability to do that. Hello? But just let me know if we can help you with anything. Hello? Can, can you hear me? We can indeed. Yeah. OK. There we go.
Still nothing? Still not seeing it, but that's all right. Uh, if there is, if you want to get started, that's no problem. And uh, right. you can guide us through it and we can work on it as you talk. Thanks so much, Dr. Frazier. Okay. I do apologize for that. Ah. Now, can you see it? I cannot, but we'll work it out. Okay. Feel free to start start right up. Sure, no problem. So I want to talk a little bit about our um, our survey results. Uh, we were able to uh, gather data from 378 uh, faculty members, uh, 732 staff, and almost 1,500 students. Uh, our, our survey results uh, were predominantly from the College of Health and Human Sciences uh, and the College of Agriculture, followed by Physical Sciences. Uh, the staff members was mostly from Students Affairs. Uh, we had a lot that participated from Facilities Management. Uh, majority of our staff that, that participated in the survey were uh, full-time employees um, who have worked uh, more than five to 10 years on campus. Our, our results, uh, as Dr. Caldwell uh, pointed out, were, were showed, showed that we have some, some issues that we need to work with on campus, uh, really across campus. Uh, in our survey, uh, with a lot, uh, uh, if we read through that, the, as we read through our remarks on individuals that made that were made, we the, our concerns were with student retention, particularly with students from underrepresented populations, and with students um, who were first gen, but also uh, we had some gender inequities and some other inequities uh, with pay and salary. And, and so one of the things we decided to do as, as we, because at the same time we rolled out the climate survey, we also rolled out our strategic plan for the university, uh, our Imagine 2023 plan. That plan really consists of uh, uh, our core values for the university, as we move further and the plan coming out of this office was how uh, do we create a scorecard there was a balanced scorecard on how we were doing with some of the issues that came out of the out of the survey uh, so our pillars that we focused on were student success and engagement uh, diversity equity inclusion uh, branding and and strengthening and nurturing partnerships uh, research and innovation and sustainability uh, and what we were doing, if we were doing our part on uh, sustainability across campus, maybe uh, combining and utilizing resources differently. So in our in our scorecard, um, we talked about the vision for across campus and how we were going to have a diverse and culturally responsible student body uh, and have our faculty and student and staff mirror that that we had as a student body. Um, and then our mission become more inclusive and welcoming institution that values the respect of all of our differences and to increase our student retention graduation rates, create a strategy for post graduation rates while also cultivating a, a positive university environment. Um, so as we talked about that, we developed uh, unit of effectiveness plans across the campus. Um, and if I could share my screen, I will share those with you. So we developed those across this, across campus um, and then tried to increase uh, training. So as we redefine what the diversity, equity, inclusion meant for this university, while also uh, negotiating with our union reps to create some uh, pay equity, uh, which 
uh, that that's going to be a while while we do but while we do that. But two years in a row, we've been able to consecutively provide a two percent raise. Now that does not sound like a lot of money, but for eight years, uh, eight consecutive years rather, uh, the university had uh, no uh, raises. And so as we continue to uh, improve retention and we continue to talk about how we have an inclusive campus, we'll also address those, those salary inequities. Uh, also, we have made it a point to change uh, just based on our summary of our results, change our hiring practice practices. We have restructured our, our faculty handbook uh, as we look to improve the hiring practices. We develop new online training for everyone that, that is involved in the search to, to make sure that we have a broader search um, and, and look in different places and advertise in different places uh, for individuals that we bring to campus. I, I would like to be able to, to show you those numbers, but don't look like I'm going to be able to show you uh, this, this the data that we have. So I, I, I would at some point in time want to show you our scorecard and show you how uh, we plan to create this metrics or how the metrics should work um, to improve from a five year standpoint up to now, uh, up to current date, and then how we plan to move forward. Are, are there questions so far? And I know my uh, presentation has really been uh, all over the place. But if you have questions, I'll be more than willing to answer them. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, thank you to Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Frazier. Let's go to the, uh, to, to the questions. Uh, so we will, you can submit questions for either Dr. Caldwell or Dr. Frazier. So let, let's go ahead with the, with the questions. We'll start off with this goes to Dr. Caldwell. How does the racial demographic relative to response rate compare with the racial demographics of each of the campuses? Um, that's a, a great question. I think uh, the I would say that based on um, the fact that we had a 52% response rate, so you're looking at maybe half. And I would say that the data shows that, for example, we had overwhelmingly uh, white, 77%, and then we had 10% uh, Asian. And when we look at our faculty, I think that that's about accurate, 7% African-American and 3% Hispanic. Uh, I recently looked at the affirmative action reports to basically see where our numbers are. And so I would say they're very similar. It was, it was accurate. The numbers were um, accurate based on um, faculty. I think we probably could have had more students of color uh, participate um, in the study. But as far as faculty, staff, students, and administrators, I think the numbers were fairly accurate and reflective uh, of the data. So they were aligned. I'll just say that, uh, just to be very clear, they were aligned uh, with our demographics on campus. Thank you. Thank you. Here is another, another question. I think it's for Dr. Caldwell. Have you conducted a similar survey of students who leave SIU to assess their actual experience while at SIU, uh, which will help with retention and also with recruitment? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, probably one of the things that should have been shared is that I started SIU July of 2021 along with Dr. Frazier. <laughs> so we've been uh, both there a little over a year. Um, I say with full confidence that SIU has conducted uh, surveys, climate surveys in the past. Uh, we're using this data to benchmark benchmark from this point forward our tenure so we can make sure that we're tracking it and, and improving the climate. Um, but I will say this, it is not common um, always for uh, schools to, uh, you know, by the time you oftentimes realize a student isn't coming back, they don't usually tell you in advance they're not coming back. It's not a process. They just maybe don't show up uh, the next semester. And I would say national data, a lot of times when you ask students, why did they leave? It's typically for financial reasons. That's really one of the number one reasons that they cite leaving the campus. And it also could be sense of belonging. Uh, but I will say in most cases, when you have faculty and staff leave, it is part of our human resources process and faculty process to do what we call exit surveys. So you're more likely to get exit data information from a faculty or staff member 
who departs the campus than a student. So I just wanted to be clear about what current processes we have. And um, it's a good idea, but that information is not widely tracked at this point. So I hope that answers the question. I'd be willing to, to follow up if, if needed. Okay, thank you, Dr. Caldwell. This is a question for Dr. Frazier. You you talked about some of the examples that uh, uh, of what you're you're doing now uh, on the Carbondale campus, and uh, you you talk about the uh, you talked about the training. Can you give any specific examples of of, uh, of the of training like like you're giving you're using the students or faculty and so on? So so we have. Uh four various trainings that we're utilizing. Uh, for students, we provide, and students, faculty, and staff, uh, we're providing uh, bias training. Uh, and, and for every search, uh, if you're doing in the hiring process, everyone on the search committee has to go through that training yearly. So if you have it for a year, then you're good, because we, we plan to change that uh, because it used to just be face-to-face -face and we've added that online. Uh, so including that, we've also done, uh, included our safe zone training, which is for our LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we're adding a, a green zone training, which is for military veterans and help them get antiquated back uh, into the real world, as well as how faculty and staff and some students can help help them adjust. Um, and, and then we've done, uh, uh, we've just started uh, training by college, uh, where we go through uh, the micro and macro aggressions, but also do the bias training uh, by each college. So we just recently finished uh, last week um, aviation and we, uh, automotive mechanic and started in the, one of our largest colleges, and we'll expand next week to the College of Ag. And who conducts the training? So we've had uh, individuals uh, in the Multicultural Resource Center, so the Safe Zone training. Oh, I forgot uh, training about DACA as well for our undocumented students. So our, our coordinator for the LGBTQ plus resource center does the Safe Zone training, uh, the bias training myself, and our coordinator for affirmative action uh, does the training. Uh, we've also brought some consultants in to do some of those trainings because uh, it's such a vast number and we wanted to offer it to as many people as possible uh, during the fall and spring semesters. Okay. Another question for Dr. Caldwell. Uh, in response to the findings, you, you mentioned that more attention needs to be given to women in leadership at SIU. As a women-focused organization, we have been observing that issue for some time, and it is appreciated that the survey confirms that phenomenon. However, as some of us have also looked at race inequities among faculty at SIU, uh, uh, this wonders if your findings also show race and ethnicity equity at a system level, or is this an issue overshadowed by happenings at the three other campuses? Oh, uh, Ms. you're, you're that's called well, thank you. Okay, yes, I actually have read that. I, is there a way you can share a little bit more, unpack that for me a little bit more? Or I know it was Ella Tracy. I don't know if she can unmute and maybe clarify. I've read the question in the Q&A and I, it's, it's not clear to me what exactly is being asked. Okay. Ella Lacey, I have uh, allowed you to unmute yourself if you would like to uh, expound upon that any further. Sure. In the interest of brevity, I probably left some things out. Um, <laughs> I am retired faculty from SIU from some years ago. And I know at that time and, and in subsequent years until the last, say, three years, faculty um, racial equity was missing at SIU Carbondale. So see, in a way, this question now would be for Dr. Frazier, because I'm talking about the Carbondale campus. But since you reported on system data, I was wondering if you felt that looking at all four campuses, the other three campuses had enough of a number to overshadow that inequity at Carbondale campus. 
Yeah. Does okay. that help? It does help, but it's, okay. it's clear. And the response to your question, I would say no. Um, we are, you know, I, I look at national data and just across the nation, and, and, and we're no exception on the Carbondale Edwardsville School of Medicine campuses. We, we definitely, um, you know, need to, it, it's not overshadowed, and we need to do a much better job of recruiting uh, and retaining um, faculty from racialized ethnic groups. Um, so it's the system or the other campuses don't compensate <laughs> for what is lacking at the uh, Carbondale campus. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's move on to another question for, uh, I think probably for, uh, for both Dr. Frazier and, and Dr. Caldwell. Are you developing an action plan to look at the areas of need of the survey and how uh, how you can assess that uh, that plan? So, Dr. Caldwell, if you don't mind, if I could answer the, answer the first part of that, is that that's included in our strategic plan, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that that's really going to help us is the accountability piece and making individuals accountable uh, for making corrections. And so in each college, each department, in asking them to fill out a unit effectiveness plan, uh, we talk about one, how, how do you address the hiring? How do you address uh, retention, right? How, how was your plan? Because some of them didn't necessarily even have a plan on how to move forward on that. And, and what's the timeline? What's the metrics you're gonna use uh, to measure success and how often will you review it? So each one of those items are included in our unit effectiveness plan for the entire campus. And then we break it down individually by college. Okay. Dr. Caldwell, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I would. I would say that we are also, uh, we have a system um, strategic plan. And again, to uh, complement what Dr. Frazier said, we specifically have strategies, we have a timeline, we have metrics uh, to assess progress, to measure progress, and to also make sure that there's forward movement. Um, actually, just this past week, uh, all of those different um, areas was asked to specifically submit an implementation plan and to make sure that we're on track. So we have those strategies as a system office, and we also want to be uh, responsive. So I even mentioned the conversations of understanding. Uh, we It was important for us to be transparent with this data. A lot of the comments suggested that I'm writing this. Who's going to respond to this? Is this going to be given adequate attention? And so again, we're like, well, we're going to have conversations of understanding the entire academic year about these concerns. We are going to make sure that we're looking at the campuses and, you know, coming up with strategies. We actually did an Illinois uh, equity symposium, SIU hosted that. We had over 34 organizations participate in that across the state. And the whole focus was, again, what are some strategies um, can we do for equity? Even today, I was on the call with Complete College America, and they're going to also work with us about looking specifically across the system of what specific strategies that we can employ, and rather be encouraging students to take 15 credits, making sure that they're not taking uh, remedial courses. Our campuses have uh, gotten rid of that, looking at uh, DFW rates, drop failure withdrawal rates to make sure that it is not disproportionately impacting students from underrepresented backgrounds, veterans, our adult students. So again, we're looking at very specific things to make sure that we have equity among our students, that we're recruiting and retaining faculty of color, and that um, across the board, I'll just reinforce this, that people feel like they can show up at SIU, that they can thrive, that they can flourish, that they feel welcome and that they have a sense of belonging. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And a, another question, I think for both of you, uh, what about mandatory leadership training and study for faculty and staff in positions of authority? People may be skilled in their field, but does that mean that they're good at leadership and interacting with staff, faculty and students? You know, I, I want to actually start with that because um, that was one of the questions and I actually I'm smiling a little bit when I say that because one of the questions that we asked was how important is diversity training um, and, you know, equity and inclusive training. And I smile because every group basically said every group needed it more than them. <laughs> so when we asked staff, like how important is diversity training? Overall, we had more than 75 percent 
of our team say it's important. But then we said, well, if you can rate it, staff would say, well, we're the least in need of it. But faculty administrators, they really need it. You know, and then students said everybody needed more than us. And then um, our faculty said the same thing. They were like the administrators, the, you know, um, other team members, they needed more than we do. So I, I kind of chuckled that there was a strong sentiment that people need DEI training, just not me, just not my group. <laughs> and so, but again, it, overall, it was high. So we're going to move forward with that overall sentiment that it's needed. And we are going to, and, and I mentioned, um, I, I look at, leadership and DEI training very similarly, because again, we're talking about organizational improvement. So if you have a diverse group of people that you work with, in order to lead that entire group well, you need to be effective at DEI, but you also need to be effective at leadership. So again, I think that DEI in some ways is a byproduct of effective leadership, of effective organizational um, you know, enhancements. And so we actually are combining um, those two you know, uh, training processes. Thank you. Dr. Frazier, did you have anything to add to that? So, so one of the things that uh, we've done collectively, and of course you're trying to do this uh, uh, across the entire campus, is that we've started at the very top. Um, so last week, um, our campus in, in included uh, deans and associate deans for training. And then on December 2nd, we'll have uh, our advising, enrollment management, and student affairs. And so we're starting at the very top on some of that training. One, dealing with our retention rates, also reviewing all of our data from IBHE and our data from our, our Power BI that we kind of house. Um, that, because one, we want to create our own dashboard to house that information so we could track, uh, you know, track, track our growth, um, track enrollment, track uh, retention, and, and track our hiring processes. Okay, thank you. And this question is for Dr. Frazier. I found when I was teaching at SIU, that many of our students who came from farms and very small towns felt this by ur urban students, both because of their hip accents and because they liked what more urban students saw being with it or sophisticated. Given that this is a very rural area, is this something you are addressing? I think this was experienced by both white and black students, although our very rural areas tend to be largely white. So, so for our campus, uh, I, I mean, you're actually right, but for our campus, we're we're almost sixty percent first gen, and and so if you're first gen, it doesn't matter if you're coming from rural Southern Illinois, um, East St. Louis, or Metro East or parts of Chicago, there are things and challenges that, that you're gonna to come to this campus with. So our job is to make sure uh, that we have enough wraparound resources and create opportunities for them to engage with each other. And so one of the things we've talked about more than anything, because research was, will tell you that engaged students are the most successful. And so not try to engage them from just a cultural sense, but from a social sense. Uh, because if you just go to class and go to your class, I mean, go home and you never engage, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. Even for some of our 4.0, 3.5 students, we have to create opportunities for you to, to engage. So the beauty of being here at SI, uh, SIUC is that you have an opportunity. If it doesn't exist, you have an opportunity to create it um, in, our, in our student organizations. And, and so we, we, we publicize that, we make sure students understand that. Uh, we've done different training and different uh, retreats inside of housing, which is really more than a third of our student population. Uh, so we actively try to inc increase the times that they engage with each other, regardless of the communities that they come from. Uh, thank you. This next question, I think goes uh, for both of you. Uh, I didn't hear anything about international students. Were they included in this in this survey? Uh, yes, and I could speak to that as I look at my notes, and I apologize uh, for that omission. 
uh, because I do have data to share about that particular group. But when we uh, interview uh, international uh, faculty, 64% uh, at staff as well as students, uh, we looked at the, the mean and 64% of international uh, respondents overall felt welcome on our campuses. And we also asked if they felt respected in the community. Um, and the answer was yes. Uh, but when we looked at those numbers and disaggregated further, what we found is that they felt less welcome in some of the surrounding communities, maybe sometimes because of um, you know, I would say uh, language barriers, that was some of the data that, that shared and they just when they would go into some of the areas, they just didn't feel as included. So again, on campus by faculty, staff and students, they felt respected when they went out into the community, um, they felt, you know, less welcome and less respected. We also found that to be true, um, even when we specifically disaggregated international uh, faculty, staff and students uh, on our School of Medicine campus that they felt uh, the numbers were over 70% um, high for faculty, staff, and students feeling respected in the classroom, um, on the campuses, uh, but again, in the community, uh, the numbers were the lowest. Thank you. Dr. Frazier, did you want to uh, comment on that question about international students? Sure. Uh, our, our international student population is comprised of uh, basically six countries, and and so one of the things, our challenge is uh, during COVID and uh, as we become a, a campus that, that like, we, like I said earlier, wants to completely engage is how do we improve those numbers for international students? And so the IBHE data doesn't house or collect that data for our international students. So we started collecting that data, uh, but we've also tried to improve our recruiting uh, and partnerships with different countries. So as we move along into next year and the years following, uh, you'll see those numbers uh, improve. Because um, we, I mean, most institutions lost their international student populations during COVID. All right, thank you. And this question, uh, we'll go to Dr. Frazier. I'm concerned about gender equity on the Carbondale campus. Women administrators being replaced by men, women administrators having to leave SIU to move up in administration and so on. And, and how is that being addressed? Uh, like I said, again, we, we, uh, we've tried to have uh, hiring practices that are, that are broader uh, to have more candidates in there. And we never want to set quotas, but we do want our best candidates. And, and so we can't go into uh, looking for an administrator saying we want a particular gender. Uh, we want the best candidates to move to the top. But in order to, uh, to make sure it is diverse and that our searches are diverse, uh, if, if the search doesn't include women, we'll cancel the search, right? And if it isn't diverse, we'll cancel the search and start over. All right. Uh, Dr. Caldwell, did you want to add anything to that from a system-wide perspective about gender equity? Uh, yes, I think one of the, the things I was actually recently having a conversation with another leader about is now that we have the, the data to show that it is uh, a, a significant area of growth. Uh, I could think about one of the mechanisms I put in. I know you read in my bio that I, uh, when I was at Wheaton College, I paid a lot of attention to the uh, the data as it related to gender equity. And one of the things that we put in practice that I did for every search is that I use what they a uh, gender decoder app. And what you do is you actually take a, a job application or a job description and you put it in the gender decoder app, and it will let you know if this. Um, job ad that you're about to post is gender, it's, it's feminine coded or masculine coded. And what the data has shown that if you have a masculine coded job ad that you will decrease your uh, female applicant pool by about on average 22%. So when you are trying to grow that population or invite that, and I do believe that a sense of belonging and welcome stops with, starts with how you do the job ad. So you have a lot of language that doesn't appeal to women or that might be off-putting or again, that's masculine coded. You know, even though you might have good intentions, you literally might be um, isolating uh, that particular uh, community. So I propose that that's something that we do with all of our job ads. I know when we were specifically hiring uh, the chancellor for the SIU um, Edwardsville campus, uh, that's one of the first things I did. I put the job description through the Gender Decoder app, and I would be happy to share that in the uh, chat. 
and I was and I was pleasantly surprised that it was not it was neutral, which is very rare. I had only saw two other neutral uh, job ads, and I probably looked at over sixty. And it was neutral, so it didn't appeal to men or women. And so that meant both genders had a fair shot at applying for this position. And so again, that's what you want. So that's one recommendation of I have. I agree with Dr. Frazier. Again, we're not uh, definitely meeting quotas, but we want to be intentional. If we see that, um, again, when we look at higher ed, uh, it's been more than like three decades now that women have been have dominated. And it's across racial ethnic lines. You have more Asian women, the Asian men, you have more African-American. And I know actually Carbondale is one of the campuses that's unique nationally that they have more men students than women. But again, we want those uh, women, uh, those female students to come on campus and have access to mentors, to have access to professors, to be able to, um, you know, see themselves. Um, and see themselves in leadership. So it is an area of growth and there are strategies we can do to mitigate that and to make sure that we're inviting um, highly, high ability, high qualified women um, into the SIU uh, pipeline, not only at Carbondale, but across, across the system. Thank you. Well, that uh, answers all of our questions. I just want to say from a personal perspective that as, as former faculty member, uh, a retired faculty member from SIU, and it's it's really a pleasure to see some specific action actually actually happening now for SIU specifically in Carbondale, but definitely for the entire system. So thank you for the work that you two are doing. It's, it's, it's commendable for sure. Thank With you. that, we'll turn this back to Joe Pichard, who is our program director for the Carbondale branch of A AUW. Joe, thank you, thank you Marcia. Okay, thanks everybody. Especially, we want to thank Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Frazier for this outstanding program with such cutting edge information. And we are looking forward to all the positive impact that these findings are gonna have on the SIU system and the Carbondale campus. We're very grateful to both of you for sharing your valuable time with us. It's been an honor. This presentation will be available through the Carbondale Public Library's YouTube page and Facebook page. So please encourage others to view it there. And thanks to the Carbondale Public Library for hosting all of our Zoom meetings. On Tuesday, December 13th, the AAUW Carbondale branch will hold an in-person meeting at the SIU Faculty House at 7 p.m. entitled Coming to America. Chun S. San will share his experiences and adventures as a young man who at the age of 20 came to North America searching for a better life. His hardships and adventures on the journey were described in the book, Crossing the Mekong, a story told by Chan S. San and written by Alberta Skaggs. We invite all of you to attend. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you are interested in learning more about AAUW, please go to our Carbondale Branch Facebook page and the AAUW Illinois website. We welcome questions and we welcome new members. Good night.